going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. All the bodies in this exhibit are of uh, Chinese men and women. Um, and there are some grave uh, uh, racial uh, overtones here. If these were bodies of American citizens or American soldiers, if these were bodies of uh, Katrina victims, if these were African Americans, if uh, uh, insert your interest group here, but I think this wouldn't have been allowed here. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. Since it opened in mid-February, nearly 150,000 people have visited Bodies, the exhibition at the Cincinnati Museum Center. The exhibit features 20 full body specimens and dozens of individual organs that have been carefully dissected to reveal musculature and various body systems. The exhibit is owned by Premier Exhibitions, which acquires its specimens from a lab in Dalian, China. That lab takes unclaimed bodies and prepares them through a months-long process known as plastinization that replaces natural body fluids with clear plastics, rendering them stable, odorless, and poseable. Premier and a dozen museums that, and the dozens of museums that have presented this exhibit argue that it allows the general public to gain insight into the human anatomy and the underlying issues of health in a way normally reserved for medical personnel. The exhibit has been controversial wherever it has appeared. One set of questions clusters around the appropriateness of the way that the bodies are presented and whether the exhibit's sensational, some would say ghoulish appeal, overshadows the educational value. A second set of questions involves the source of the bodies. These questions were thrown into high relief by an ABC 2020 report that aired soon after the exhibit opened in Cincinnati and are of particular interest to people of Chinese descent. Last Thursday night at the Freedom Center and this coming Thursday night at the Museum Center, the public is invited to join a discussion of some of those issues. Obviously, I have a giant conflict of interest. I'm an assistant vice president at the Museum Center, but I work as an in independently as a journalist for Local 12. I am joined this morning by Wen Yi Wang, a medical doctor at, uh, New in New York City. She is the editor of a Chinese medical journal published here in the United States and is a practicer of Falun Gong, a religious group that has been widely persecuted in China. She is here because of participating in one of the public forums and by Morris Tsai, a Cincinnati entrepreneur. Welcome to Newsmakers and Dr. Wang, welcome to uh, Cincinnati. You literally, we're taping this on Thursday, you literally have just flown in. I really appreciate you being here today. Well, thank you. And Morris, so of course, Thanks, I appreciate Dan. you being here. I want to make it clear that I also invited a representative, a spokesperson for the Museum Center. Uh, they declined just as they did several months ago when I did a show about this uh, when, the, when the exhibit was opening. So anyway, with that, all of that out of the way, uh, Morris, what is it? You live in this city. Uh, you have seen the dynamics as this has gotten started. From your perspective, what is it about this exhibit that concerns you, that you want people to think about? Well, I think the main issue that I'm concerned with is the idea of where these bodies are coming from. Whether they're um, legitimately, uh, well, uh, the Museum Center basically uses unclaimed bodies. And because they're unclaimed, it could basically be anything. And that was the first question that was raised. It's where are these bodies coming from and what are they doing to get it? And uh, when, it first, when I first heard about this, I actually contacted the Museum Center and asked them a bunch of questions. And they, they really wouldn't give me any answers besides that they were unclaimed bodies. And yes, we have, you know, quote, documentation that says everything's legitimate. The exhibit is actually owned by a company called Premier Exhibitions, which is a for-profit company. And there are numerous versions of this same exhibit. There's one in New York City at South Street Seaport, and there's, I, I think there are eight of them right now somewhere in the world. And uh, my understanding is Premier tells the specific museum or the venue that they have this documentation, but you can't see it. They just assure them. Is that is that your understanding? Yeah, that, that is my understanding. It's it's basically uh, they say, well, we've we've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's, but um, you just have to trust us. 
and and that's the whole issue. It's like it's it's a for-profit enterprise, and we feel like that there should be the burden of proof of the museum center should should actually instead of saying, well, just prove us wrong, you know, somehow you guys prove us wrong that, oh, these bodies are political prisoners or something like that. The Museum Center should be taking the ethical high road and actually be actively seeking the truth, mm -hmm. you know, where these bodies come from. Dr. Wang, you are a medical doctor. What's the difference between the way, say, a medical school in the United States would acquire a body, a cadaver, for dissection and practices in China? When you talk about the uh, using a human body, especially if they say there's an unclaimed uh, body from China, and the people have to be very careful because number one, and uh, we have to know the culture of this country. And usually, and uh, everybody knows for thousand, uh, 5,000 year history, Chinese have no, uh, no tradition to donate their body or, or organ to anyone. That's a tr tradition. For Even a long to time. a medical school? There's no tradition of that? Then a few individuals, maybe there's some individual, because if you look at the Chinese, uh, yeah, their own publication, medical publication, each year the donation of the body or organ to the uh, public is less than uh, 200. This is a official number by Chinese uh, ministry, if you look at all the literatures. This is because um, the long tradition, Chinese always consider the body is a sacred part given by heaven. When you died, you need to uh, uh, burn the buried in whole, and otherwise your soul cannot go back to a next life, go, go next life. So it's not only that, and, and so uh, everybody knows that in, the, in China, we are talking about a different issue now. In China, in organ transplant, which the area I'm really concerned is, 98% uh, uh, by, this is a per, the minister, uh, vice minister of the health in China, is coming from the executed prisoners. In another word, and the, those, the organ, and the use, dissect, and all, they actually from the, I would say, is, and uh, we need a questioning, is it all of them are willing donor so, in that way. So even, I mean, aside from this public exhibition mm -hmm. question, you're saying that in the area of og organ donors, organ supplies of organs for transplant, that most of those come from executed prisoners? Do you have documentation for that? Can you the, prove that? Um, the, this is what it, the West Minister of the Health, China, he claimed. And 2006, I think it's in August in Manila, in Philippines, there's a, a ministry a meeting in there and that he had been questioning and by others, medical professionals, about the source of the organ transplant. Because that's the year we reviewed when I worked for the Epoch Time. And the organ they use for transplantation, some of them, oh, and after 2000, actually from Falun Gong practitioners, we have a document of that. So when he was asked about this question, uh, he admitted and 98% uh, of the organ for the last 40 years is uh, coming from executed prisoners. And less than 2% actually is a family uh, direct numbers, uh, members uh, donation or bring death patient. Morris and I were actually talking about this mm -hmm. be before you arrived mm -hmm. and you were pointing out that in the United States we have a system of organ donors which simply, and I think this is what Dr. Donor. Wang is saying, it, it, practically for all practical purposes doesn't exist in China. Correct. Right? So this, now you were mentioned the practitioners of Falun Gong uh, are persecuted, many end up in prison and that is a particular concern to you that practitioners of, of this approach uh, are, are subjects to the uh, transplant question, but also possibly ending up as part of these exhibits. Is that, am I correct on that? That's what your concern is? Whenever I talk about the organ transplant so far, that's my concern. And when coming to the body, so far I didn't have a direct evidence is any practitioner's body being used. And, but the question is, uh, after those 
practitioners, their organ being removed unwillingly while they are alive. But if a liver or heart being removed, you, we know that it's basically persons die, mm -hmm. and where there's a body gone. So, so whenever it's involved the organ or the the bodies, we always have to ask: uh, Is any relationship with those people? Morris, the the question that, and you mentioned this before, that not just the Cincinnati Museum Center, because these, this has been at museums all over the United States and Europe. I mean, this is not just a phenomenon in this city. Mm -hmm. The argument from the museum center is always, or the museums, is always that this is, the primary purpose here is educational, and that it is uh, a chance for ordinary people to come to an understanding of human anatomy and physiology in a way that normally we don't get to do it. What and what's your response to that? Why do you just dismiss that? Do you discount that? What what's your response to that? Well, the first thing I'd like to say is that I'm a really strong believer in education. Um, the Chinese are actually very. Uh, I mean, that's the one thing that growing up, education is totally emphasized, and and you know you do well in school and you study hard, and so that's the first thing. I am I am totally pro education. But the question is. Um, in relations to museums, actually that's a relatively new thing. And that was one of the reasons I was concerned about it coming to Cincinnati Museum Center. Before it showed in Cincinnati, in a lot of places it was showing in malls, it was showing, right now currently they have an exhibit of this at the Tropicana in Las Vegas. And if you look at it, if you go to the website there, it's, they call it entertainment. It's not education. But it, what about if you put it in the context of a science natural history museum, as opposed to the context of a mall or a Las Vegas casino, does that change it? Because we, uh, because the museum center is a educational institution. Right, it is. But um, I, I would say it's edutainment. You know, the kind of it's more entertaining than education. I mean, you're not going through with a teacher to learn about the things. Well, there you're are just, many, many. Some people do. do, but they're not going through with an anatomist to explain these things, a lot of times they're just going on a more superficial level. I do understand that um, perhaps it could generate interest in anatomy and things like that, and that's, and that's good. But the bad thing is with an educational exhibit that doesn't deal with the ethical issues of it, um, that leads to Nazi experimentation or Tuskegee experiments um, where you have things that are actually clearly educational value. We learn things in science by experimentation, but I mean, no one's going to claim that Nazi experimentation on Jews was a good thing mm -hmm. because there's no ethical backbone behind it. You know, after the 2020 uh, uh, story that was done back in late February, early March, uh, Doug McDonald, who is the director and president of the uh, Museum Center, made a statement, and I would like to we have that, we can put that on screen. It's the 2020 statement um, in which he pointed out that it's, he said, it's important to note that Premier Ex Exhibitions has presented legal documentation stating that all specimens in the exhibit died of natural causes and were unclaimed and unidentified bodies legally obtained in full compliance of all international U.S. and state laws and that uh, provided, the 2020 report provided no new conclusive or credible information regarding uh, the body's, ex ex the exhibition. What do you think about that? Do you, you saw, I'm sure you saw the 2020 report. Do you think that, and you were saying before, who has to present the evidence here that there is a direct tie between the bodies in these exhibitions and uh, some uh, prisoner who has been executed. Whose obligation is that? Well, I think it's the museum center's obligation to, to find the truth. I mean, they want to be an educational mm -hmm. source. Um, you should present the whole truth. And the idea is that um, I think they want with premier exhibition is, is plausible deniability the ability to say, and this is exactly what they've given them. They say, well, you know, just show them these whatever documents that we say that we, we swear that these things are perfectly, you know, legitimate, and then the museum center can just say that, but they're not going any further. Dr. Wang, what, what would you say to that? I would just say the, um, 
the person who hold the uh, the the exhibition should ask the the provider who want to um, show this in public, and uh, we need a really solid evidence. And also, I really uh, want to call the international community. Some organizations should be coming out and to do the independent research on this because uh, there is an impossible, there is an unclaimed body in China. I definitely sure if unclaimed usually is a p political conscience. Because, like I said, the tradition. What Chinese about about, my understanding is there has now been legislation introduced in the United States Congress to ban the importation of these plasticized bodies. Uh, and one of the co signers of, co sponsors of that bill is Congressman uh, Mike Turner, who's from uh, Ohio. And in fact, I invited him today, but he's still in Washington. Uh, he, couldn't, he could not be here. Do you, are you, either of you aware of this legislation? Are you involved with it? Are you hopeful about it? I just heard actually, but I think it's uh, the good timing and for people to really think about these issues because uh, organ harvest issue and the body parts uh, exhibition issue. Because when we're dealing, United States is a civilized society. When we're dealing some exhibition and the parts coming from the country, there's no rule of law and, and so, the, there is no donation system and, uh, exist in, in that country. We have to be careful. This is not something personal uh, against a certain museum or anything. Mm -hmm. It's really for your own sake of a reputation. You don't want your reputation Morris, being tarnished. What, what would you, and I'm aware of time, what would you want people to do here? What do would you, the people of Cincinnati, this exhibit will be here through September or into September, what, what would you ask the people of Cincinnati to do? Well, I just want people to think about it, just to, to understand and just not um, be seduced by the advertising that the Museum Center is doing. It's just, just think about what it would be, they're all Chinese bodies, what would the, it be if it were all blacks, African Americans, um, or Jews? Mm -hmm. I think just the idea that it's all one race is disturbing enough. But just to think about the issues that these people are human beings, that they lived a life if they're unclaimed, then um, something unfortunate must have happened or whatever. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm out of time. Uh, Dr. Wang, thank you for coming to Cincinnati. You will be part of the discussion on this, uh, and by the time this airs, on the past Thursday night at the Freedom Center. But just as Morris said, to ask people to, there will be an opportunity. You would like to think these issues and join the discussion of the issues around bodies, the exhibition. The Cincinnati Museum Center will host an open forum next Thursday night, May the 29th at 6 p.m. at Union Terminal. Thank you for being here this morning. Stay tuned. After the break, what 6,300 local teens say they need to grow up as responsible adults. Welcome back. 400,000 children under the age of 19 live in Hamilton, Claremont, Campbell, Kenton, and Boone counties. What do these young people need to grow up as healthy adults? How do we as a community shift from reacting to young people with problems to engaging and developing them so that they thrive? The YMCA of Greater Cincinnati, the Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Cincinnati, the Dan Beard Boy, Ca Boy Scout Council, and the Girl Scouts of Western Ohio have come together under the name of Asset Builders to address those questions. I'm joined now by Leanne Lutterell, the Director of Asset Builders Alliance, and by Sandy Walker, the President of the YMCA of Greater Cincinnati. Welcome to Newsmakers. Um, this is a very interesting report, and one of the things, Leanne, that this identifies is various assets, 40 assets that young people need sort of describe some of those and 40 seems like a lot but but how do you how do you look at that how do these break down what, what what's the dynamic that you see here the 40 it is a lot and these are the key things that young people need in their life so it is somewhat involved but um, sometimes we talk about the assets and we break them down to two main categories of external assets which are assets that young people get from their community either from schools, from home, from, from the adults in their lives. Um, and then there's also the internal assets, which, which are oftentimes um, built through programs. There are competencies and skills that young people really need 
to navigate through life. So these, these are things, these are characteristics, these are personality traits, these are ethical principles, whatever. That, exactly. That said. Um, looking at 40, does every human being need to have all 40? Do, what, what's, the, what's needed here? What the research suggests, um, they look at the assets that kids have in their lives and they also look at certain risk-taking behaviors and then certain, certain thriving indicators. And what the research shows is that kids who have 31 to 40 assets tend to engage in less risk-taking behaviors, such as problem alcohol use or violence. And kids who have more assets tend to also engage in positive behaviors, mm. such as doing well in school, um, exhibiting leadership, valuing diversity. Sandy, the YMCA or the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts or the Boys and Girls Clubs, these are organizations that have forever been involved in helping young people grow up and develop the characteristics they need. How is this different for the Y and for your partner organizations? How is putting it in this format and branding it as the, 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 in this way, how does this change what you do? I think it supports what our four agencies have been doing throughout our history, but it gives us as a community a common context and a language to be sure that we're all talking about young people and focusing on the most important things they need to thrive and be successful. So when you saw this report as the president of the YMCA of Greater Cincinnati, what were some of these that you, know, you said, oh, you, know, you either personally you thought it was really interesting, important, or surprising, or you then talked to your staff and said, we got to really deal with this. What, what jumped out at you from this report? Well, I was pleased to see that uh, adults as role models and adults who are uh, important in kids' lives continue to be an important factor and something we all have to work on. And our agencies have a unique opportunity to provide that. I was surprised to see that opportunities to be creative is very low in our community for young people. So all of our agencies can take a look at ways that we can create new opportunities for young people to be engaged in creative opportunities. I'm also encouraged to see that the United Way and the STRIVE initiative are all also focusing on assets as a way to assess whether we're doing the important good work we need to do on behalf of kids. And we, t we had STRIVE on to report about their uh, benchmarking just uh, what, six weeks ago, I guess, is when that came out. Leanne, the, uh, Sandy brought up this question about we don't have enough opportunities for creative outlets. What does that mean concretely? What, I, I, and how would we address that? Well, if you think about um, the things that make us as adults come alive, the things that, get a, that make us passionate, um, whether it's the arts or music or um, opportunities to express ourselves, um, a lot of times that's expressed through creative activities. And so on the survey, it asked the kids if they have opportunities to be involved in these types of activities. And only 18% of kids locally report that they have these opportunities. And so I think that should tell anyone who has that opportunity that. Is this an indication that because of budget pressures in schools and things that a lot of those kinds of pro art programs, art appreciation programs have had to be squeezed back or out of, of the curriculum and therefore the community and community organizations have to pick those up, Sandy? Is that what that really is, uh, is about? Well, it's hard to know exactly what it means, but it seems like that's a likely possibility, Dan. I also think it's uh, great to think about Dr. Benson from the Search Institute, which is the organization we use to take the survey. He talks about we as adults need to help young people find their spark, find what it is deep in their hearts that just gets them excited, sparks their passion. And anything we can do to get to know young people and help them find the thing that speaks to their heart, that's going to help them thrive. And I think that speaks to the creative juices that young people need to feel good about themselves and about life. You know, you, you mentioned Dr. Benson and the spark and all of that. Is this more than just a Cincinnati phenomenon? Is this happening all over the country? Is this kind of, of process happening all over the country, Leah? Yes, there's actually hundreds of communities that have mobilized around this same asset framework. Mm -hmm. And they've seen amazing things happen in their communities as they involve young people. Okay, so we're, we're part of a much larger process. I want to make sure that people can take a look at this report. Uh, if you'd like to read the report and learn more about asset builders, 
check out the, their website at www.ouraba.org, uh, and the, the full report is on there. And I trust that uh, the, the Y is going to put its assets behind this and start building this project, is that right? That's right, it's really important to us, and it's important for the whole community to see youth as resources. Well, thank you for being here this morning, and we'll follow this up as, as it moves forward. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet the men and the women shaping our community for the future. Have a good week.